I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Hey everybody, it's Chris Bumray here again for JoeBlow.com with another video edition of the best movie you never saw. And this week we're taking a look at 1994's The Shadow, which was based on a famous pulp hero by Lester Dent that was turned into a very memorable radio series starring Orson Welles as the voice of our hero Lamont Cranston, who in the film version of The Shadow is played by a young Alec Baldwin. Now in it, Lamont Cranston is a former American mercenary who worked as a warlord in China that was redeemed by a holy man. Now he's posing as a playboy and uses his newly acquired mastery of the dark arts to fight crime as the shadow. And when a renegade pupil of his former master, Shi Wan Khan, played by John Lowe, fresh off of The Last Emperor, emerges in New York, Cranston finds himself face to face with an adversary whose skills rival his own. Now this was directed by Russell Mulcahy, who was coming off of Highlander and those amazing early 80s Duran Duran videos, and co-stars Penelope Ann Miller, Ian McKellen, Jonathan Winters, Peter Boyle, and Tim Curry, and has an amazing score by Jerry Goldsmith. Now The Shadow came along at a very interesting time for superhero movies. With Batman and Batman Returns having been major hits, the studios were looking to dip their toes into the genre but seemed totally unwilling to deal with big comic book companies. That's why when you got a movie like Captain America made, it was done for a bargain basement unit like 21st Century Films and the movie was pretty much unreleasable. The big studios stayed away from these companies. As such, the movies that they made tended to either be originals like Darkman or based on cult properties like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Crow, Spawn, or The Rocketeer. But one genre that they did explore quite a bit was old time pulp. Rumor had it that for a long time Doc Savage was in active development, The Phantom eventually got made into a film starring Billy Zane, and of course there was The Shadow. Now, with noted visual stylist Russell Mulcahy at the helm, fresh off the disaster of Highlander 2 The Quickening, The Shadow was a really ambitious attempt by Universal to make their own Batman. With rising star Alec Baldwin in the lead, who apparently actually screen tested for Batman back in 1989, and Martin Bregman as a producer fresh off of Carlito's Way and a script by Jurassic Park writer David Kep. The budget was pretty hefty at $40 million, not bad for 1994. So obviously The Shadow was intended as the start of a major franchise, but you know, it just didn't work. As Penelope Ann Miller put it herself in a Random Roles interview, you know, it's hard to tell the rhyme or reason why certain movies make it and some don't. A lot of it is timing and a lot of it's how they promote it. I don't know. I think it could have been, I really do. I think it's a fun film to watch and I don't know why it didn't catch on. There could be a lot of variables that I, unfortunately, don't have any control over. And sure enough, one of the big variables that The Shadow ran afoul of was the fact that it came out in the midst of so many hugely successful films. You see, when The Shadow opened, The Lion King was the number one movie at the box office and still playing to sold out crowds. So in its opening weekend, it had to settle for number two, but what was even worse was the next week, Forrest Gump hit theaters and took the nation by storm, and totally took the wind out of the sails of The Shadow, and they weren't able to make it up the next weekend because guess what else opened? True Lies. Oh gosh, she's got the most incredible body and a pair of titties make you want to stand up and beg for buttermilk. Ass like a ten-year-old boy. <laughs> So basically you had the number one, two, and three movies of the year all opening within a couple weeks of The Shadows. No wonder it was doomed. It was actually kind of lucky to walk away with $32 million, but that gross was nowhere near sufficient enough to justify a sequel, a matter made worse by the measly $18 million that it made internationally. In fact, Alec Baldwin says that it was one of the films that kind of hurt his career, with him saying in a New Yorker interview, in 1992, I did Malice with Nicole Kidman, and that movie was very cookie cutter thriller, it did pretty well, and in 93 I did a remake, The Getaway with My Wife. That was a bomb. I did The Shadow. That was a bomb. In 94 I did Heaven's Prisoners. That was a bomb. In 95 I did The Juror. That was a bomb. And in 96 I did The Edge and Ghost of Mississippi. And that's when you hear the sound of the wheels of the train screeching to a halt. Sure enough, the film did okay on home video and cable, and it was actually one of Universal's first DVD releases, albeit in a really gross pan and scan format. And it went down as a major box office flop, which is too bad because to an audience of a certain age, The Shadow is a much loved film, although anyone not born between 1979 and 1989 probably hasn't heard of it. 
Heck, the movie never even got an anamorphic DVD release until a few years ago when Universal hastily put out a Blu-ray, which was followed by a superb Shout Factory upgrade that reunited much of the cast and crew, including Baldwin, who hasn't really discussed the film all that much since it tanked in 1994. Now, it's been pretty well covered on Joe Blow, with me writing a best movie you never saw about it, Jason Adams doing an awfully good on it, and Alex Mady giving an entry into the unpopular opinion. So I guess I'm not the only one who likes this movie. Over 20 years later, I think many critics look back at it as an example of how Hollywood had just no idea whatsoever how to handle comic book properties before Marvel got into the game, but I think it's still a swell little film. I enjoyed it so much in theaters that as a teen, I actually collected cassette tapes of the old radio show Orson Welles did back in the 30s. And I actually find the premise pretty intoxicating, with the shadow emphasizing trickery and terror over Braun. The film doesn't quite stick to that idea with the Baldwin shadow getting into scraps and often shooting his way out of trouble with him carrying two guns at all times. But hey, what works on the radio may not have worked on the big screen. And overall, it's a fun yarn with some pretty nifty special effects for 1994, including some pretty early CGI. And of course, the score by Jerry Goldsmith, I think is probably one of his best. And John Lone, who was really doing pretty well at the time, after The Last Emperor and a really cool Christophe Lambert movie called The Hunted, steals the show as the bad guy, Shiwan Khan. If you want to see another great movie with John Lone, I definitely recommend Michael Cimino's Year of the Dragon, co-starring a very young and very unrecognizable Mickey Rourke. Had John Lone come along at a time when Hollywood made more of an effort to find decent parts for Asian actors, I think he honestly would have become a huge star. But I have to say, his movies from this era all hold up pretty well. Alec Baldwin himself does pretty well in the lead, although I have to say, some of his line readings are really weird in this film, as if he wasn't fully committed to the premise. I think in some ways, Alec Baldwin did kind of look down his nose at the material, and he tried to go for a camp portrayal that really didn't mesh at all with the rest of the film. I'm on to your plan, Khan. You still don't have the beryllium sphere, and without it, you can't complete the bomb. Besides, you know I'm going to stop you. Penelope Ann Miller is great, she's gorgeous as the love interest of Margot Lane, and indeed I had a pretty big crush on her as a kid, and little known fact, she was married to Will Arnett, who was in his early 20s at the time, who later on would get famous playing Job Bluth and of course Bojack Horseman, and she was married to him at the time that they did The Shadow. And guess who plays her father in the film? None other than Ian McKellen doing a very early paycheck guild in one of his first Hollywood movies. Yes indeed one of his first Hollywood movies. Ian McKellen was actually in his 50s before he finally went all in on Hollywood. In fact, Ian McKellen was apparently kind of nervous when he did this movie. In an interview, he said, I was very nervous because what's she called? Ann Miller? Something Ann Miller? Young girl? Penelope Ann Miller? Well, she was American and I had to try and be American and that just never works for me. But I was also with Tim Curry and Old Maids and well, that was good fun. And we had a very, very nice director, Russell Mulcahy, and they had these wonderful sets. That was the thrilling thing about it. Wonderful sets. It was a big Hollywood movie, you know. We filmed it. We were out in the streets of downtown LA and it was thrilling. Absolutely thrilling. Now, after a goofy prelude that sets up Alec Baldwin as a Chinese warlord, and I'm not even joking, the movie jumps ahead several years to his reemergence in 1930s New York, opening with a stylish, creepy battle with some gangsters trying to kill a witness, who the Shadow then recruits for his underground network of agents. It's a pretty stylish scene, and I think that it really sums up what's good about the Shadow. It's a cool, beautiful looking movie, but I have one big issue with it, and this is a problem. The makeup job on the shadow that actually makes Alec Baldwin the shadow is really weird. In fact, it makes him look almost exactly like one of his brothers, Daniel Baldwin. If this movie was made now, there's no way they would have ever allowed Baldwin to look this way because it really just doesn't look like him. It could be anybody in that mask, including his brothers. It's really distracting when you spend the whole film wondering whether or not that's actually Alec Baldwin under the makeup or not. And I have to wonder, is it actually him under the makeup? I mean, did one of his brothers fill in? It's very possible, I guess. Alec Baldwin was a busy guy back then, and Daniel Baldwin, well, I guess he wasn't. Now, if you want to see The Shadow, it was recently re-released on Blu-ray in a terrific special edition by Shout Factory, which gives the movie the digital upgrade it always deserved, and of course, you can buy it on iTunes. While a flawed movie, The Shadow is pretty good pulpy fun, and it's a real shame Baldwin wasn't allowed to continue in the role, but the movie's box office just didn't justify it. Subsequent installments might have done a better job at exploring the mythology of the character and maybe would have fixed some of the non-so-great bits, including the fact that Baldwin plays it all as High Camp. Oh well, 
The Shadow remains a terrific throwback actioner and a nice undiscovered gem for fans. Until next time, for JoeBlow.com, I'm Chris Bumbrey.